Now, one would say that this was the biggest financial scandal of the 20th century. So it will always be the most embarrassing period of my life. And it is really simple things that would have stopped it happening. As much as that period was difficult, it was a period of self-reflection. You know, I think I've become a, a fairly accomplished after-dinner speaker um, over the last number of years. I was in Chelsea last night talking to a group of, you know, serious investment professionals. We saw a quote where you said you were the most unemployable man on the planet when you left prison. So I got arrested at Frankfurt Airport, a place that I was actually at on Monday, which was weird. I was coming through the airport and I was thinking, God, you know, am I going to get through here this time? So all of those people that were friends back in the 1990s when all this was was happening are still friends today. You know, if you're candid, if you're honest, if you're genuine, it will shine through. You know, if you're telling lies, it will shine through also. Welcome back to the tea show where it's time, time to trade thoughts. I'm Poku Banks, one of your tea guys, and joined by Gabriel, your other tea guy, your favorite tea guy. I'm just kidding. Well, we're here to talk about trading and relate the lessons that we can learn from our guests and explain it to you guys. So, how have you been, Gabriel? It's so kind of you to ask, Poku, because I've been having a great few weeks. Yeah. Genuinely, like, what a last episode that we recorded, right? I'm still reeling off of a bit. Don't ask me what impact investments I've made, but there's been changes. We'll dive into that, but, you know, personal life versus public life. We'll keep that to a part, but yeah. Just honestly thinking about how good that, that first episode was, how motivated it got me, mm -hmm. um, not only for my own personal life, but for this year on the T show, it, it's going to just be such a good time if we're going to continue to have guests like that. How about you? Yeah, no, um, again, Impact Vesting is slowly integrating to my portfolio, but right now it's just, you know, the current seas and whatnot. Like you're only trading in green companies now, right? Yeah, I'm <laughs> but slow process. Slow percent. But you know, the audience may have noticed actually there's only one guest for today. Hmm. And the reason that is because we're changing the structure of how we do the tea show. Prior, we used to have two guests on the bright man and the unique guests. But the problem we had was we had to cut out some of the gems and the conversations we had to keep the show to a decent amount of time. So now having one guest, it allows you to soak in all of the information and experience the conversations that we're having just like it is in real time a hundred percent i mean at the tea show here we want to listen to the feedback we want to hear what the audience are saying how they want these episodes to be and we want to make sure that we are providing the best show every single time for the listeners experience right mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we've done we're flexible we're changing and that's why we've got an incredible guest on today that you are going to learn so much about who is he? The one and only Nick Leeson. So essentially, he is the original road trader. You now there's documentaries, movies made about this guy. And essentially, what he done was pretty grave. He was hiding and amassed losses of over a billion dollars for the Barons Bank. Now, imagine, you know, you're trading and you're hiding all these losses. A billion with a B? Yeah. Oh, B wow. Like, yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's a lot more than an M, a, hundred, a thousand Ms, you know, so those losses, he led him to get arrested and it'll be great to learn from how he went through the process for going to prison not only that seeing movies and documentaries made about him and understanding how life was after coming out of prison because he's still a trader so it's nice to understand how someone from back when jason was trading mm. is now trading now so yeah, it's gonna be really interesting because he's gonna have a unique perspective and there's clearly a lot of lessons that he's learned from scenarios that i'm hoping me and you never get ourselves into um yeah god, god forbid <laughs> Um, but yeah, like we said, cool to kind of steal his knowledge, his experience and his lessons to hopefully develop ourselves into, you know, better, more educated people. So this is, this is going to be one hell of a show. Let's dive in, get him on and have a great conversation, right? Yep. Where it's, it's time, time to trade thoughts with Nick Leeson. Now we're here with a great guest on the tea show. Now. How I would describe him as the original road trader that was unchecked for his risk-taking and drive to success, which caused the collapse of the Barings Bank. Now, one would say that this was the biggest financial scandal of the 20th century. We've got the one and only Nick Leeson. How are you doing? Yeah, good. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, great. Yeah, I appreciate that. And with that description of yourself, how was it going through that whole process, especially like at the when the engines got cool? 
Yeah, it's like obviously I have a very checkered past. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a difficult period. I, when you look back at everything you want to achieve in life, it, for, for me, I always wanted to be successful. I wanted to be making all the important decisions um, within the organisations that I work for, the banks that I work for. So, you know, if I look back on that period, it's the complete opposite of what I wanted to achieve. So it will always be the most embarrassing period of my life. You know, it will always be the period that I'm most remembered for. Um, you know, whatever I may do in the future, that will be the part that people um, always always go to. Uh, and, and for that reason, it is always the most embarrassing. You know, there's nothing I can say or do that's going to change that. Um, you know, I suppose over the years, I've had to be very realistic about it, yeah. come to terms with it, try to build myself back up as well. Huge fear of failure. And, and that's what stopped me putting my hand up and telling people what was going on and asking for help and advice. And it is really simple things that would have stopped it happening. Um, but I didn't have the moral fiber or the or the strength to do that at the time. You know, this was 28, 28 years ago now. So, you know, 1990s banking were all about ego and greed and celebrating success and you know, people didn't talk about failure. And I, I think it's so important because we're all going to fail, you know, and especially if you're trading, you, you, you know, you're going to, you should, you need to be used to failing almost every day. And it's yeah. how you deal with that. And um, I didn't deal with it particularly well. And, uh, you know, that had serious ramifications, both for me as an individual and for the bank. I can imagine you've reflected on it many times. So it's definitely good to hear that you've like gone through it and then sat down and thought, yeah, if so-and-so would have been done, then things would have been a better situation. Well, I didn't have a lot of choice. I was in prison before. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I definitely had to think about it then because the ramification of my actions were very clear and obvious um, when I was there with, you know, four four walls for company, really. So, and that, to, to be honest with you, I'm kind of grateful it happened because, you know, otherwise you kind of le live your life with your foot on the accelerator and you're trying to do everything and you're, trying to be as successful as you possibly can be so you know as much as that period was difficult it was a period of self-reflection and you can you know you can try to improve yourself from that point onwards i want to pick up on something you just mentioned yeah. just about the idea of obviously you went to prison and you come out of it on the other side of it now i think we saw a quote where you said you were the most unemployable man on the planet when you left prison probably <laughs> but Right now, you're sat opposite us. You're on a podcast. Uh, I mean, you deliver talks and conferences and speeches. Sure. You've rebuilt a career. How have you done that? I'm not always sure what the answer to that is. The um, Slowly is, is one of the answers. Um, just because when I was released from prison in 1999, I didn't know what I'd be doing. Um, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to disappear into the ether and never be seen again. You know, that's one of the options. Or... You know, you choose to kind of stand up and represent yourself in the best possible way that you can. So I think prison enabled me to start sort of building on my self-esteem and self-worth again. You know, try to get back to the basics of what I as a person represented. You know, I was very loyal. I was very good with all of my friends. You know, I'd always protect and support people, probably to my own detriment throughout that story. So you slowly build build it up. You don't really, you know, I had cancer whilst I was in prison as well. So you never really, I was never looking too far ahead. Um, you know, I wanted to get back to the UK and, and, and enjoy myself a little bit, I suppose, in the first year. And then, you know, there was an absence of structure in my life. So I did a degree in psychology just to put, just so I had to get up in the morning and go places and, and do stuff like normal people did. Just because I was, you know, I'd go out and party at the weekends and wake up on a Monday morning and feel empty because everybody else would go to work and I was sort of nursing a hangover and nothing to do that week. Um, so doing a degree, put that structure back in and kind of helped me develop from that point. So it really is, you know, like I, I, I'm not going to give you any massive wisdom in terms of how I managed to go through that process, but it's been, a, you know, it's been a slow, gradual process. And, you know, somebody asked me to do some after dinner speaking at an event in, in London absolutely hated it you know you try, you try to be too funny you're nervous you just don't know what to expect and you know I, and i've been doing it for 24 years now so hopefully i'm better now than i was 
24 years ago, but it's a career almost. And I've been very, very fortunate. You know, people leaving prison like I did all of those years ago aren't afforded the possibilities that I was. So I'm very grateful for that. And I, I embrace that. And, um, you know, I think I've become a, a fairly accomplished after dinner speaker um, over the last number of years. I was in Chelsea last night talking to a group of, you know, serious investment professionals. Uh, now I'd love to, perfect time if we could put up the first video of your first ever public speaking right here, right now on the <laughs> clear button. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I mean, like, you must have had a lot of big challenges, walls, barriers put up in front of you when coming out of prison because just in terms of maybe the way that people interacted with you when you were looking for a job, the immediate kind of like resistance, your friendships that maybe you'd built and some of them had maybe deteriorated. I mean, what were the hardest things that happened, I suppose, maybe in those 12 months after? It's, it's a great question. And um, and and again, I'm not sure that I'm going to go straight to uh, um, an immediate answer for you. It was you know, my friends have always been my friends, right? And I think they stay with you throughout. So I grew up on a council estate in Watford and, you know, the, the, there's a certain amount of camaraderie that exists in those sort of environments. And, and, and that's still there, right? So all of those people that were friends back in the 1990s when all this was, was happening are still friends today. You know, we, maybe we don't cross paths as much as we do, but that's just a, a function of life. I'm living in Ireland. They live in, they live in the UK. So there was never... I don't think there was any barrier there. You know, people had to sort of get used to each other a little bit again after all of those years. But um, but that's always been the same family and uh, family and friends have always been solid. Right. And so they've always been that backbone that have meant that I've always got something to rely on or turn to and ask for that help and advice that I didn't do all of those years ago. If I wanted to if I wanted to communicate with people, because I think one of the biggest barriers or, or one of the biggest failings for me, all of those all of those years ago was that I wasn't a great communicator, you know, so I kept it all in, I, you know, I thought I could cope with it and ultimately proved that I couldn't. Um, Work-wise, um, it was it was a weird situation. I was offered a, I was offered a risk management role for a Dutch energy company uh, fairly soon after I was released from prison and uh, I was still dealing with the liquidators. So I had an injunction against me for a hundred million pound um, that was there right? I wasn't doing a great deal to pay it back at the time, but there were people who wanted me to do TV interviews. So somebody in Holland paid a lot of money to do the first TV interview. I did a, a, a week-long serialization in the Daily Mail. And that kind of, I think that changed people's perception a little bit because it was the first time in four and a half years that people had actually heard from me, you know, because I was arrested. I was in prison in Germany. I was extradited back to Singapore. So, you know, there was lots of sensational stuff that was coming out in the media that wasn't really accurate. Um, but, you know, there was no um, there was no comeback from me. So there was no voice answering back. Um, and so that changed opinion a little bit. Um, and then I think the more you engage with media in general terms, like if you find yourself in a in a difficult situation and I, you, you see this with so many people, you know, it's quite easy to, you know, start to have a bit of a fight with the media. And, and answer them back, w w whether it's print, you know, or TV media or, or, or whatever. And, and so I, what I found personally is the more that I made myself available to people, you know, the more people can form a, a more um, considered opinion of you rather than just looking at sensational stuff um, that's printed in the media. And I always, you, you know, I speak to some people who found themselves in sim similar situations and they you know, they ask, what do you, what, what did you do? And I ju they just need to make themselves available. And, and, you know, if you're candid, if you're honest, if you're genuine, it will shine through. You know, if you're telling lies, it will shine through also. Yeah. You know, so, you know, be careful that you're not going on somewhere and you're telling lies because people will tell you, people will take you apart. And rightly so, you know, and you, you do see it more often than not with politicians than anybody That's else. The first <laughs> category of people I think was coming into my mind when yeah. you were saying like, don't fight back against the, the yeah. media. And, and they have a, yeah, that's their first, that's their first, their, their go-to move all of the time. You know, they get their back up, you know, and, and you can see that they're lying and they, you know, you can see that they're, or, or they're spinning a line that they've been taught in, in some form of media training over the years. So I, you know, like I always try to be as honest and candid as I possibly can be. Um, doesn't necessarily paint me in a better light. And I, like I have no intention of trying to do that. 
you know, it is what it is. You deal with it. And I think the more honest and candid from a personal perspective, the easier it is for you to deal with as well. Yeah, that's powerful. And then talking of sensationalist headlines, what were any fake myths you may have heard when coming out thinking, this ain't right? You, or you like, might have just dismissed, or you may have actually um, like addressed. There were loads of things at the time. I mean, I, I was in prison in Germany, so I got arrested at, at Frankfurt Airport, place that I was actually at on Monday, which which was weird. I was coming through the airport and I was thinking, God, you know, am I going to get through here this time type of thing? Is it your first time back there since? I think I might have been there once before, but I was... Uh, I had to fly from I had to fly from Luxembourg because it was the only way I could get back to Ireland. So I had to fly from Luxembourg to Frankfurt and then Frankfurt back to to Dublin. And uh, I, I was at an event and the person who was speaking before me was a former German police officer as well. So you know I, I've got all these memories bombarding me on Monday. So you know I'm listening to this German police officer speak and I'm going to Frankfurt in a couple of hours. <laughs> And, and I think, no, I don't want to go there again. So there was a few sort of sensations that were occurring all at the same time. So that was potentially difficult, um, difficult to deal with. In terms of the, the worst story, um, and, and there were a few, right? Because it was, you know, I think the degree of um, authentication that newspapers in the UK had back in the 1990s was far less than they have now, right? So... There were lots of stories about different things that were happening in Japan. And, and, and I know the stories, right? So, and, and I know the person who was involved in those stories, but it wasn't newsworthy for that person to be involved in it. So it was described as my double commission deal or, you know, my episode that, 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 of something that I was involved in. But the worst one and, uh, was um, I'd been sentenced. So I was, I was in prison in Singapore. And um, they wake you up early anyway, but this morning they woke me up particularly early and they took me to a general area where, um, where there were people there from the Singaporean inspectors, the Singaporean police, and there were a couple of officials that had come over from the UK as well. And so they sat me down, it was about seven o'clock in the morning and, um, you know, there, there were a few pleasantries and I said, look, you know, I don't know why you're here. Um, I, I've got nothing else to do, so I'll listen to you, but I don't know why you're here. And so eventually it got round to it and they said, we found it. And I said, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, you're going to have to elaborate. I don't know what you found. And they said, we found your, we found your bank account. And I said, you can't have, because there isn't a bank account. So, you know, this is a worth, it's a worthless exercise now that we're going to go through because I can guarantee that there is no bank account. And they said, well, look, we've got it. You bet, you better fess up. And I was like, there is no bank account. I know that there's no bank account. So eventually they rumbled around in their briefcases. They had one of those big legal briefcases, you know, a bit bigger size and whatever. And they brought out the Times newspaper. And so the, and the, they put it on the table and the headline on the front page of the Times newspaper. So one of the more reputable reputable brands in the, in the UK was Leeson's £50 million bank account. So I said, that's a newspaper. You know, like, unless you're going to show me a bank statement, I'm not going to answer your question. Like, this is, like, it's ridiculous. People have flown over from England to see me and everybody else has come in. And so I said, look, if you want to bring a bank statement back, but, you know, I, I don't have a legal representation here. I'm not going to answer any more questions. But if you bring a bank statement back, I'll gladly answer any any questions that you may have. So years later, there was there were, there were two guys that were called the investigative team at the uh, Times newspaper at the time. I won't name them, but, um, you know, they kind of followed the story from its beginning to its end. And then when I was released from Singapore in 1999, one of them was then the editor of the Sunday Observer. So he phoned my lawyer and he said, would Nick write an article for me? And, you know, they offered a sum of money and my lawyer said, y you know, he might or he might hit you. It will go one way or the other and I can't guarantee which way it will go because he doesn't particularly like it. So he took me for lunch at La Gavroche in Mayfair. Uh, Michel Roux was there and he was, you know, he was serving us food. And uh, this guy said to me, you know, what was the worst story that we wrote? And I said, that one. You know, I said, I have no idea where you got it from. It, completely ridiculous. And he said, we had a private investigator working for us in Germany who was following a case uh, for Prince Edward and Sophie Wessex or, or, or whatever she's, she was referred to in later years. And they were following a particular case and he kept this private investigator came back with the 50 million pound story. Times had never seen a bank statement. They just took his word for it, published it in the newspaper. 
Um, and, and that kind of, you know, again, if you don't engage with the media and you don't put your side of it, you're going to get stuff written that can be completely inaccurate. It's taken as fact, isn't it? Once it's printed in newspaper, unless there's any response to it, yeah, the public take that as fact. Yeah. Maybe not so much nowadays, but probably um, back then. I mean, that's quite an incredible thing to be put out against your name and obviously you said you you kind of just responded by saying i've never seen it before did it have actual ramifications for you negative impacts or was it more just the stress of thinking there's another thing about to come against you that you knew just wasn't true do you know what it was it, it was weird because i was because i was arrested off the plane and i went straight to prison in germany you know i never had to deal with the media glare that existed for four four and a half years so i was kind of I was a little bit immune to it. It was just another knock, you know. So I, I used to um, I used to get the uh, papers when I was in prison in Germany, and I'd speed read them. You don't like reading about yourself when it's negative, and you know you, you kind of just try to get through it as as quickly as you possibly can. It hurts, right? You know, like if, uh, every time you pick up a paper and you read my name, it would say dis disgraced bank banker or fraudster or whatever. You kind of have to get used to it. It so it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm kind of um, Teflon or whatever you like in, in in that regard it kind of doesn't stick anymore but it does impact my wife and family and you know I do worry about that that sort of stuff and you know it's not then they're, they're not fame, fair game you know you want to attack me on social media that's fine I'm not going to read it anyway you are just wasting your time you know like I'm sure I have keyboard warriors attacking me every minute of every single day but I don't read it you know biggest I, fans uh, my biggest fans, yeah, yeah. I don't know who they are, and but user you know. one three zero six. <laughs> yeah, no, if they have no profile picture. I dismiss it. It's the, you, you can't take it seriously. I I don't read any of them. Genuinely, I don't open any of them. I don't read any of them. They don't have anything nice to say. And and I'm sure there's one or two comments that are quite nice, and I miss out on those as well. But uh, you know, yeah, there's no need to ruin your day. <laughs> but on the more on um, positive note, well, you've been working since 1985. You know, you've what from a different time when it comes to trading, especially as Jason Sen was on here, giving us the hand signals. Yeah, yeah. And you've seen the evolution from that to electronic trading and also the what culture shift. So working in Coots, Morgan Stanley, yeah, yeah. Barons and whatnot. How different would you say things have changed and especially even coming out as well of prison? Well, look, it's been, I think all of them have changed massively. You've got, you know, you've got this, uh, you know, retail traders are now um, such a big part of what goes on in the financial markets. In recent recent years, you've seen some of those uh, Wall Street bets and sort of uh, things that have happened where people have targeted particular stocks and won, which which you know, you know, twenty thirty years ago was never going to happen. Um, but people are using them. Uh, I, I think they're far more uh, versed in the financial markets than they've ever been in the past. I think there's still a lot of work to do. I mean. I know you guys, I think you guys come from a personal finance background and it's something that's, you know, something that's not taught in school, you know, and and should be because people sort of, you know, embark on their life in the, um, in, in the business world and they don't, um, they don't have any skill set to, to deal with things as, uh, as they should do, be those pensions or investments or whatever else they're doing. So there's an improvement, but there's a long way to go. Um, I think. You know, I, I think with the way that the, the, the media has moved over the last few years, it's, it's very easy to be suckered into things, especially when people are making money. Uh, and, and that allure to try and get people into involved in the financial markets is a little bit unsavory. You don't know what's genuine and what's not. Um, and, and that can be a, a very difficult route for people to... Um, to try to go down and uh, and overcome so you know you you hear some horrible stories about uh, people being scammed or misled in in terms of some of the things that they've been encouraged into through those that those sort of things um from a business perspective i think the world is far more pc than it was back in back in the 90s i don't think i would have survived these days my 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 humor and banter wouldn't have uh, wouldn't really have made it through corporate UK, I don't think, these days. Um, you you know, as I said, I speak at lots of conferences and you come across people that I used to work with and, you know, it, it, it's a difficult landscape, but it's right. You know, I think the way that, you know, people focus a little bit more on mental health and how people 
are dealing with certain issues in the workplace is is far better everything would have been dismissed back in the 90s you know you you know like for me um you know asking for help and advice would have been a sign of weakness mm. yeah you know i would it would have been you know people would have just made a joke about me laughed at me kind of thrown me in the corner type of thing and you, you would have been left to your own devices whereas what i should have seen asking for help and advice as was a sign of trying to do things correctly so i think you know, it, it's far more correct now than it was years ago. I think people are more cognizant of issues that people are facing. And, and that can only be a good thing. I think you just picked up on a really good point. Um, that specific part about the ability to ask for help and ask yeah. for advice. It's not a weakness anymore. No. In fact, it should be seen as a strength. Yeah. And I suppose the question I want to ask is from maybe specifically your experience at Bearings and obviously what you went through. Aimed specifically at people that want to get into trading or retail traders, private traders, what tips or advice would you give to them based off of your experience? Well, I think number one, they that they don't want to rush into it. I think there's, you know, I think with everything in life, you need to do a certain amount of due diligence around the people that you're getting involved with and uh, and what their expertise is. You know, as uh, as you guys have said, you had Jason on um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, for if anybody asks me who can they get involved with from a training perspective, you know, Jason is always my answer. Uh, that, that's not because he's just a friend, but because, you know, he, he's been there for 30, 35 years. In terms of anybody who can interpret a chart, I don't think there's anybody better than him. Um, you know, we have some personal experience working on trading floors together years ago. Um understand risk right it's um and and, and understand that you're going to fail from time to time as well and you know like i'm a person where failure was never an option right it was never an option i didn't speak to anybody about what was going on with me so i think communicating is, is a great tool you know being able to share your experiences with people and if you've got avenues like this where people will talk quite openly uh, about things that they've experienced and, and and try to pass on their their experience and expertise, I, I think are fantastic. Any form of communication is good. Like I, you know, I was I was sat in prison for four and a half years in Singapore, and you know, surrounded by other criminals, maybe bigger criminals than me. Uh, no, they probably weren't. But the um, <laughs> but you, not people that you wanted to talk to, right? It, it's probably, and I don't think I'm being rude when I say that. You know, there were different sort of educational levels and, and, and they just, you know, different interests. I could talk to them about football and that was kind of it. So you didn't speak to them about any issues you were facing. So for me, the journey along improving my communication was, um, you know, keeping a diary and writing to myself. So I was writing down about things that I was experiencing, issues that I may have faced and trying to work out what I should have done as opposed to what I did do. Um, but just that whole journey improving the communication was, you know, was a massive thing for me. Um, now you can see I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. Not not a thing on a podcast. No, but asking for help and advice is like it doesn't matter what you're facing, whether it's a personal finance issue, a health issue, you know, whether you're trading or you're working in any form of business. You know, you're surrounded by people that can help you, but they can't help you if you don't ask. Right. You know, uh, again, you know, going back to to some of those things, like I had an issue with, uh, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer whilst I was in prison in Singapore as well. And only through learning about it and asking a few questions, you become part of the process as opposed to being just a passive recipient of what the doctor tells you. So great tips. Yeah. No. Hopefully you see any of those mirrored in the way that you trade at the moment, things that you can yeah, learn no, from that. Asking for help, definitely, because again, the best way I like to put it is that um, if you get in a car right and you've got a long journey ahead, so to put it in trading terms, you got you want to get to the road to success, a GPS will help because at least it'll give you directions and you get a smoother journey. So that's basically getting a mentor and whatnot. Yeah. You can probably still drive from here to Scotland by yourself, but you may, you know, take a longer route or you may, you know, you may run into traffic, whereas a GPS can help you get the smoother route. So yeah, definitely ask them to help. It helps in the trading journey and helps you definitely faster like yeah. like trading can be a really lonely place you know especially when it's going against you yeah. you know that, and i think it's it, it's far more you know, i mean you're almost isolated you're looking at a screen you know the screen's not really your friend you can't talk to the screen you might 
throw it around every now and again if you're if you're having a particularly bad day but yeah it's just it, you can get really isolated trading so i think these you know we have a forum or a you know a, a, an environment where you can chat with like-minded people and um but i think mentor men, mentorship is great if you if you get onto the right person but you've got to do a bit of due diligence about it as well because there are some there's some um some people that the masquerade as as something other than they are out there yeah, not for sure and so when coming out of prison right I guess around that time it was a rise of retail trading. Yeah. But I can imagine that for you, trading may have been at the back of your head. You didn't want to get straight back into it. Or how was that process of looking back into the markets? Because it's yeah, it's a it, it's a weird one. I think once you're involved in the markets, uh, uh, you know, for, to to any sort of degree, you 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 never leave it behind, right? So you kind of always know what the the, the exchange rates are, and you kind of know where where the markets are you don't really have to um, be looking at a piece of paper or a newspaper to 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 underscore that you know what's going on within the financial markets so so I don't think you're ever completely divorced from it um, and it's you know I don't think there's a I don't think there's an industry that is um, as exciting um, because no two days are the same there's always something different happening in the world that you've got to evolve into your trading strategy or into the way that you're looking at how things may happen in the financial markets and i don't think any other industry has that sort of um appeal or you know constant change no two days are the same so i always used to love going to work you know and um long hours and and stuff like that but that was a way of proving myself and achieving what i wanted to achieve and 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 ultimately you know for a short period be successful so it was a good way to measure yourself and I think success is a good way to measure yourself as well um, I think I got very fixated on it during my time uh, working in the financial markets and it was all about you know I had a very exalted opinion of what success lo looked like uh, being at the top of the organization making all of the important decisions and you know, I've had to sort of downplay that and understand. And, you know, this is part of the process. And again, education and, you know, thinking differently about things and re, re rephrasing the way that you think about things. But, you know, putting food on the table for your children to eat is a form of success. You know, so as long as you re reframe the way that you're thinking about certain things, and I've had to do a lot of that o over the years. And, and, and that all helps you to, you know, improve yourself as a, as an individual and self-esteem, self-worth, you know, all of those sort of things are, are important as well. And trading, unfortunately, can damage a few of those when it's, when it, when it's going against you and, uh, you know, just keeping those lines of communication open, I think, are, uh, I think are huge. Am I correct in saying you still trade today then? Yeah, I do. I trade every day. I've got a couple of positions on at the moment. So I won't tell you what they are. <laughs> just in case where they're going. I don't know. Yeah. Is it is it a completely different landscape looking at maybe even from a technical point of view or from a psychological point of view, what you're doing today versus what you were doing in the 80s and 90s? Yeah, look, for me, it's all about risk now. So you're... You know, obviously the sums of money that I'm involved with are far smaller than they were years ago, but it's, yeah, it's all about understanding risk and controlling that risk. You, you know, trading could go one or two ways. It's either going well or it's going not so well, right? And I, I think when it's going well, it, it, it you have a, it, it's very easy to believe that it's easy uh, and it, it never is. So, you know, and the most important part is as well as you can manage a good day, you need to be able to manage a bad day. And that all comes down to risk and, you know, acting quickly if something's going going against you, acting appropriately and, uh, and making sure that you don't do what I did all of those years ago, freeze, just build on the position um, and, and, and try to deal with it yourself all of the time. You know, the importance of using stops and and things like that is is paramount with it within everything that I do, and um, you know I find it easier to take a loss. Like every trade that I take is going to be a winner, and I'm sure everybody in the in the trading world feels the same. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it, would you? Like it, it's counterintuitive if you, you know. So you've put this trade on; it's going to be the biggest trade you've ever done. You're going to make the biggest amount of money, but you're going to have a, a, a occasions every every day almost where you're going to have to take a loss on some of those. So, there is that counterintuitive nature 
to it. And, you know, the first time you take the loss is always going to be the most difficult, but I think it can be, you know, rewarding is not the right word, but it can be the most defining moment in terms of your trading journey because, you know, you've got to get go through that process and get used to it. So then in a few words, how would you describe the way you trade now? I, I um, in a few words. Well, well, you, well, you can take your time. <laughs> in a few more words now. <laughs> yeah, no, the... Uh, no, my, my my strategy is fairly simple these days. You uh, like I'm 56, right? So I don't want to be stuck in front of a screen for 12 hours a day. I couldn't think of anything that would would wreck my head more. So, um, you know, if you want to make money, you need volatility. You know, otherwise a market doesn't move. So, you know, I just try to extrapolate that out and think. You know, when um, when are the most volatile times, and when can you guarantee that volatility? And the answer is the opening period of a market. So the European Open, the opening bell in New York, and probably 30 to 45 minutes either side of it. So you're guaranteed a movement. So that's where I focus my attention. And, you know, especially around the opening bell. So, so, so And you get a lot of spoofing. You get a lot of um, uh, layering, occur, occur, which is illegal these days, but it's what, delicate. What do you mean by spoofing? Then? So people put orders in and then they take them away. Um, before the opening bell. So we used to do it years ago and Jason, well, um, actually let me not put Jason in the dock here, but the uh, but we would have all, we would have, <laughs> yeah, beep that one out. So the, um, no, you, you know, one of the one of the tricks years ago on the trading floor would be that if you were coming close to a new high or a new low, is you would make the next price trade. So if, if the market had gone up to 90 and the next price was 95, you'd buy one at 95. And so in the act of buying one at 95, that may have triggered a stop. Yeah. So the stop would come in and it'd take it up to 140. And so you'd let the stop try to run itself out. You'd sell into the t top of the stop and then it'd come all the way back down to 90 or 95. So that was just one of the tricks years ago. So, you know, that would be an example of maybe spoofing the market as well in terms of just making that next price tick. Because if you're behind a screen, and you're just seeing the price go 95, 100, 105, 110. You just think there's a huge buy order coming through. Yeah. And it's not. It's somebody just deliberately trying yeah. to, to trigger a stop. And then that may trigger another stop and it might go up 100 points. And, you know, from your trading journey, you'll see that there's many times a market might go up 100 points and then come immediately down 100 yeah. points. And that's kind of the activity that you're, that you're witnessing. And you'll see more of that around the opening bell because you'll have opening orders um that that need to be initiated if a stop triggers it has to be completed so there's a you know there's a time pressure in having that order um completed and so those sort of movements around the opening bell are, are really what i focus on so i trade an hour an hour in the morning um and then an hour again or an hour and a half maybe between half one and three o'clock when you when you're getting those initial moves yeah that's really that's really good because um a lot of people don't understand that you can trade part time. Yeah. Also live your own life. Sure. And do your own thing. And, and and having that variety is important. I think you know, like walk the dog, and you know, spend some time with the wife, and yeah. uh, and do some normal stuff as well. Because otherwise, you you can get consumed by it. Yeah. You know, just sat in front of the screen for for all of that time of the day, and you know, it makes you fairly dull and boring as well. I think. So with your strategy, essentially, it's very efficient where. You wake up, you trade the first hour off the Open for London, and then you go about your day, walk your dog, and come back to the New York Open. But what about the overlap between those sessions? Yeah, I'm I'm not too worried about it, to be honest with you. I think, you know, you can see, you, you know, the other periods of the day where you might see a bit of movement around the closing bells. So I don't, like, the the the, the, um, the American closing bell is, is always quite dangerous. So I try and keep away from it. You know, you can see some you know, fairly big moves coming in to either ramp or push the market down. And so I, I try to avoid those. There is a bit around the European close. So when the UK and, and German markets are closing and you might see a bit of movement there. But it really is the, the most, unfortunately, I'm naturally drawn to volatility. Um, so, um, you know, the more volatile periods are the opening bells. And you can you can guarantee you're going to get a decent move. So if you get that period right, that's your day done. You know, you don't, um, I think one of the, you know, one of the lessons that I didn't learn all of those years ago, but uh, and maybe I should have done, and maybe I'm a little bit more inclined to believe, 
when when you work on the live trading floors, um, everything's very visual. You see everything that's going on. You see who's successful. You see who's not. It's not so easy to do behind a screen. And um, but you know some of the most successful people would go into the trading floor on a Monday, make their money for the week, and you wouldn't see them again. You know, so they you know they weren't giving it back and. It, you know, they were very, um, you know, they were content with the amount of money they'd made and it wasn't always about pushing it. And I think, you know, it's human nature sometimes to push and, and constraining that that emotion or, or that behaviour is equally quite important. Yeah, and definitely because with greed as well, especially yeah. in the markets, you want more and more. In terms of risk to reward model, Paul, what would you say you aim for in terms of your trades? I, w I would describe myself as maverick and uh, a, a, a not very traditional in those regards. And one of the things I dislike, and uh, you know, you're not going to hear this from everybody, but I kind of dislike the way that some of it's taught. It's, um, you know, when you look at financial markets and, and, and trade in the financial markets, you know, if, if it doesn't stack up from a mathematical basis, then people will... Um, you can't teach it, right? So if unless you're looking for an RRR of three, it doesn't make sense. Um, I, I think when I was listening to Jason the other week, um, you know, Jason, if a market is slowing, you know, and you're not getting anywhere close to that RRR of three, why stay in it? You know, to get out of the trade, get back in the trade. I, you know, I love to repeat trades. So if you've got the levels and you've, you've got a decent trading range that you're working off, you know, keep getting back into that trade. And if you fixate on, I have to hit an RRR of three or 2.5 or whatever the number is, I think it, um, I, I think it can have a, um, a, a bigger impact on the way that you're trading than it needs to. You know, the market's not going to get to three because that's what you need. <laughs> you know, if it's slowing down and it's hitting resistance or support, you know, you need to get out and get, get back in if you, if you want to. On a, mildly different note i think it'd be silly to have you sat here right now and not ask you about a certain movie that came out yeah rogue traders sure uh which was featuring ewan mcgregor yeah uh it's a bit of me perfect casting <laughs> role did you have a say in, in the choice of no i was in i was in prison to 1999 <laughs> the movie the movie was released in 1998 so i had nothing to do with it i think the the, the easy question to ask is do you rate it I, I, again, being honest, I've seen it twice in my life, right? So I, I saw it once with Sir David Frost, who made the movie. Mm -hmm. um, so Sir, Sir David Frost, Ben Kingsley, who played Gandhi, me and 30 of my friends watching it in a in a studio in Ladbrook Grove. There was lots of alcohol. The or after? A during. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> so it was, uh, there was a lot of laughing. There was a bit of crying. And uh, I just remember getting drunk with Sir David and Gandhi. So <laughs> the uh, so that was the first time that I watched it, and then uh, and then the second time I've seen it with my wife. I don't think my kids have seen it. Um, I was at a dinner in Chelsea last night, and they were playing it in the background. So that's the third time that I, I didn't see all of it, but I, I saw bits of it. So um, yeah, it's weird. There's at, at the moment there's some writing going on for a TV series about. You know, a similar. It will be my life story. Um, so that's kind of ongoing at the moment, and you may get that on your screens at, at some time in the future. For me, actually, I watched the movie, but the first interaction was actually I watched a documentary that okay. explained it. And um, one thing I, I laughed at in the, in the documentary was um, when you got caught, it was so you were so nonchalant about it. I think you said, um, "Oh yeah, them them people are stupid anyway." The, um, the Bearings Banks, they're all just, yeah. It was, it was just... That interview was probably with Sir David. Oh. So Sir David was, Sir David came to, um, he, he came to visit me in prison uh, in, in Germany. So he did an interview over one day that we were there and I, I think it kept, went out on breakfast with Frost. I'm sure he goaded me into a few of those comments and maybe I shouldn't have been as aggressive as uh, yeah. as the statement that you could, but yeah, look, you, you that that period highlighted my incompetence and negligence, uh, and it was incompetence and negligence on a grand scale. But equally so, everybody around me wasn't particularly good at their jobs. You know, I went to to jail for um, for the fraud that I perpetrated, and 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 completely rightly and justly so. The other guys, you know, I, I often get asked at dinners and stuff, 
should they have been prosecuted? Um, the the, the answer is no. Uh, they were stupid and they should have known what was going on and they should have highlighted it far, far quicker than they did. Um, but, you know, that's all that they were guilty of doing. Nobody was nobody was involved with me. There was nobody, you know, who was involved in the fraud in any way, shape or form. But they were not very good at their jobs. That's a nicer way of putting it <laughs> than I did years ago. So on watching it properly, I suppose the second time there was less alcohol involved. Mm. Is there any ill feeling towards it? Are you kind of, I don't know, maybe excited or proud of the fact that there's a, a piece out? I know that it wasn't your proudest moment, yeah. but there's not many people that can say there's a, a film about their life. Or do you kind of, have you cut emotional ties the same way that you do with, I suppose, comments online that speak about you? Yeah, I think you cut emotional ties, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's bits of it that you, that there is, um, there is some accuracy to, and then there's a, you know, there's a couple of bits, there's a bit of poetic license and you, you know, you kind of, you know, people will say to me sometimes, oh, I remember this bit from the movie and I'm like, I don't even remember seeing that in the movie because it didn't happen type of thing. And, you know, it's a, it's a weird, it's a really weird juxtaposition. Um, like even the thing that we're doing at the moment, I don't want to do it, right? So, but it's a historical event. So people can do whatever they want anyway, right? So if they want to make a, you know, the the history of Nick Leeson's life, they, they can do it, right? So there were a couple of different competing um, pro, uh, production companies, that I presume that is what they're called, that approached us at the same time. And um, I spoke to them both and, you know, I, I've been quite honest with them. I said, I don't want to do it, uh, but they're going to do it anyway. So then you're better off being in camp rather than being outside of the camp and... So I'm working with one of them now and I'm doing a bit of consultancy around one of the things that will go on. So there will really, I do believe that this will come to the screens in a, uh, in, in within 12 months. And so there'll be two uh, stories of my life. We'll have to bring than... you back for round two of this to Anna. Oh, you'll, be, you, you'll be surprised when you see who's playing me in this one. He's, uh, you know, you and McGregor and I don't look alike. This guy and I definitely do not look alike. <laughs> but so how they get them, I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to ask then, sorry to go back to the actual moment. That's fine. At what figure did you think, okay, this is going to, yeah. Um, you can tell Pofi loved the movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I don't think there's a conscious moment where you, where you do that, um, you know, you, if if I look at like I'd done a lot of good stuff within the banks that I worked at for prior to 1992, so if you look at it chronologically, uh, in in the year 1992 and and so at the financial year end for 92, if I'd been exposed, um, I probably would have got a slap on the wrist and be told not to do it again, but I would have been still stayed with bearings. Mm. At the end of 1993, so the second year and the loss is up to maybe 150 million, I'm I'm going to lose my job. Right. Even if it was lower than that, say it's 80 million, I would have lost my job. It really accelerates during 1994. And so at some point in 1994, it reaches the stage where it, it's going to be criminally prosecuted. But it was a weird way that it used to work back then. You know, banks would always be thinking about their reputational damage that an, an event like that would uh, would result in. And, and so I've seen it many times where you know, losses of nine, 10 million, whilst damaging to the bank would be not overlooked, but the person would be asked to leave. I think sometime in that 94 period, it gets to the level that it's going to be criminally prosecuted, but there's not a defining moment where you, where you say, you know, it's probably when the loss went past the capital base of the bank, which <laughs> is, which is a crude way of looking at it. But, um, you know, like it was a small bank, right? So um, I didn't know quite how small, I had £650 million with me that I was um, using to finance my positions in Singapore. Capital base of the bank was only £250 million. So I had nearly three times the capital base of the bank with me. They were borrowing the money. They were giving it to me and, you know, no due diligence, no understanding of what I was using the money for. Um, but they still kept supplying it. I suppose you can understand why there are so many regulations these days in that industry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I'm I'm described as one of the defining moments for some of those regulations, you know. 
So compliance and risk management is a far better educated area than it ever has been in the past. They have a, you know, if you somebody wants to put a trade on in a bank now, the first people that have to go to a, a risk as opposed to just putting the trade on and then, you know, swerving somebody in risk for the next six months whilst the trade's going through its journey. You know, it, it, it's changed. It, it's changed massively. And the quality of people are far better than they were all of those years ago. But you still have problems. You have FTX, Sam Bankman, yeah. Freed. You know, towards the end of last year, Credit Suisse has gone by the wayside this year. So it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and there's still work to do. Um, but, you know, it's more in those niche sort of, sort of areas where people are still coming to terms with it. Like crypto, obviously, is a is a landscape. Oh, that, another topic, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I suppose on that note, it's a, a really nice way to kind of end speaking to you here today about looking at the future, because we mentioned about things going on today and how it's better, but it's not perfect. But maybe even in your personal life, the things that you're looking forward to, either professionally or elsewise, um, that are just exciting you potentially, or maybe worrying you. As you get older, you always get worried about what you know what's around the corner. You know, you get phone calls from people that you grew up with who are unfortunately no longer around. So you you have those sort of issues to contend with, and that's one that I've that that's been an absolute minefield for me for for years it's just not uh you know I'd, i i i'm very focused on family these days so you know like the success for me isn't important anymore you know but i want my you know i want my children and family to enjoy as much success they possibly can so just encouraging them along the way and you know i i will reflect in their success rather than you know necessarily generating any uh, any of my own um you know i don't i, I don't need that as much now well i don't i don't think i really need it at all now it's nice to be successful right I, I think everybody will agree with that but it's not the um you know it's not the ultimate ambition and aim that it was all of those years ago so i do definitely bask and reflect in the glory of the people closest to me uh, and i encourage and kind of help that as much as i possibly can so you know just for them to continue along that path my my son's doing a business and finance degree so i'm sure he'll be the you know, the the next governor of the Bank of England. That'd be strange, wouldn't it? You know, Eleeson as a governor as the, of the Bank of England. I mean, great. <laughs> Quite a stressful role for him, though. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Uh, wicked. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on today. We've thank loved the God. stories. We've loved the lessons. We've got a lot to digest, I think. But I think anyone watching this or listening to this has had a great time. So thank you for that. All right, thank you. Poku Banks. Hey. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was really good just to see him live in the flesh compared to watch him on the screen. He doesn't look anything like Ewan McGregor. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no <laughs> yeah, but hey, I mean, he had to play a character, didn't he? No, that was an in incredible conversation. I mean, what would you say was your biggest learning? I mean, <laughs> there were so many, but pick one if you had to. Um, I feel that, you know, he actually admitted that at the time, the risk management policies and preventing certain things are happening were in place so it's just great to see that time times have changed but it still happens you know he mentioned FTS Credit Suisse last year so it's just having reducing the chance of those things for happening it's great to hear from someone that went through such a situation mm. what would you say you like you're making me pick just one yeah, I'll pick one fine um honestly we kept on asking him, like, what was your biggest lesson? And he kept on just saying, taking things day by day. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of, you know, like, oh, there wasn't like one massive thing. Just every single day he worked on himself, he improved himself, you know. He went and did that degree after um, coming out of prison. And then slowly he got a job. And now he's t he hated the idea of speaking gigs, but he did that. And he's just constantly working to improve himself. I mean, you can see the guy's turned his life around, mm -hmm. um, which is just fascinating and inspiring to see. So yeah, those day by day ideas, you know, take one thing at a time, small incremental steps, and you'll have big results over the long term. That's yeah, no, that, that's my takeaway. Hundred percent. And also, I want to add the fact that he monetized the situation. So instead of, I feel like some people that will go through that will hide, will come out of prison and hide, feel bad for themselves. Yeah, yeah, you can't you can't face people because you know you've lost so much money and you want to act like you're such a trader. So the fact that he came out and embraced it. And he's now, you know, working with different TV production companies and whatnot. It's great to see that he's going through it. And he's getting bookings. He's he's working. He's doing his own podcast. So 
He's on podcast? Yeah, yeah, multiple. Right? He's right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's good to see that he's turned it around and he, he just he took, took it to his chest and he stood on it. Love that. Wow. What an episode.